of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things ha happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day.
welcome, welcome to Shiloh Baptist Church. The praise team was hot this morning because we have come to shower down the blessings of God. You tuned into the right place. I want you to share this with somebody. Go call somebody on the phone. Tell them that praise God shower is on. There, there is a word from the Lord today. This is Pastor Duncan. I get excited about the word of God. Y'all excuse me. And today, I know this morning there is a word that can change your life. So I want you to go with me. We're going straight into the word. I want to thank my organist because God's, God's ready to preach right now. And if he keeps that music going, I might get to shouting instead of preaching. All right, go with me to Judges 16. Say, calm down. You're supposed to be Baptist. <laughs> okay, I'm doing the best I can. Go to Judges 18. Look, we believe that God has been so good, sometimes we just can't contain ourselves. Judges chapter 16. I know I said 18. 16 because we're going to begin reading at verse 18. Come on, go with me this morning. You're going to have a blessed time on this roller coaster of the word today. Judges chapter 16, beginning at verse 18. 18. That's right, we're in Judges. We're talking about Samson this morning, and you're going to find out that God's going to blow and add a new breath or a new revelation to this message that will bless us. I'm reading from King James Version today. Are you with me? Judges chapter 16, beginning at verse 18. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up at once, for he has shown me all his heart. You know, prior, Delilah had been set up by the Philistines to take Samson down. And she said, He finally showed me all his heart. The Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him to sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go up as I did before and shake myself. But he could not, for the Lord had departed from him. Watch this. But the Philistines took him put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with chains of brass, and put him in the grind to grind at the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. All right, get ready for it. Here's the word that God has given me today for as long as the spirit of the Lord will allow. We're gonna speak from this thought. It's gonna bless you. Be real. Or be we. It's as simple as that. Be real or be we. I hope this dawns on you. Be real or be we. Let's go into this. How many of you have ever told a lie? Now, I'm not wasting a whole lot of time pausing right now to, you know, get an answer to that question because I really know the answer already. All of us have told a lie at one time or another. And if you were about to fix your lips to tell me you never told a lie, then you are lying about the fact that you never told a lie, and the very fact that you would say you never told a lie means that you're messing up the lie you're about to tell. In other words, all I'm saying is you're lying when you said you never told a lie. There was a study done by the Journal of Psychology and Social Psychology which says that most people lie once or twice a day, some probably more than that. And what this journal was telling us is that lies uh, just seem to come out for certain reasons because they actually give you in the article the reasons, you know, for the lie. But I thought about what they said when they said one or two times a day. I'm thinking that's a lot of times. But then I thought about it. We do lie. Most, a lot of us lie about our past, the people that don't know us. Come on, we've exaggerated before about something we did, some accomplishment. You know, if you were a good athlete in school, by the time you tell the story, you know, a lot of folks gone, you done been out of school for a while, you were a great athlete. You know what I'm saying? You ran more touchdowns, you shot more points, you scored more, uh, you hit more home runs than you ever did in your story because you're lying. But you told it so long and so many times, it sounds like the truth. To you, but it's really a lie. Or maybe we were in school and we started out with them, do you love me, yes or no, those little notes. And then after that, maybe you had a prom date, but when you start talking about your dating prowess, 
You start talking about, man, I was a ladies man. I had all the women eating out of my hand. And or you a woman, you say, child, I had to beat them off with a stick. Come on, lies. All I'm saying is all of us lie. The question is not whether we lie. The question is why do we lie? Because that's what's germane to our text today. Why do we lie? Well, in that same article, it gives us four reasons why we lie. The first one is to promote ourselves. Um, to get something, uh, to get a new position, uh, to get some admiration, to promote ourselves. We'll lie to do that. Secondly, to protect ourselves. We will lie so that we, uh, you know, a mistake that we made, we want to cover up. Or uh, we don't want to be embarrassed about a certain situation, we will lie. Or not to get a punishment, we will lie. Not only that, to protect ourselves and promote ourselves to impact others. Uh, I thought about that because we will lie so we can control what other people think about us because we're so concerned about what people think about us. Wow. And when we do that, we'll tell a lie to make ourselves look better than we really are. And then some of us, to impact others means also that we will just tell a lie to hurt other people. And then this last category is the one that I know is filled with nothing but sin. Because there is a category that they researched that said unclear why they're lying. There's no real motivation. Here's what they're saying. There's some people out there who just lie for the sake of lying. They just lie. And we don't know why they lie. They just like lying. You might know somebody like that. And even though I'm talking about lying and you're saying, why am I talking about? How does it relate to this text? Let me tell you why. Because lying may seem cute. But the reality is lying is a sin and it displeases God. And when lying displeases God, there are some resulting consequences for your lie. Let me tell you what I mean. The whole fall of mankind happened because Eve fell for a lie that Satan told her, who is the father of lies. And then the ninth commandment, when Moses went up to get the commandments from God, God threw one in that said, we shall not have falsehood, or we shall not make a falsehood, meaning that we can't bear falsehood against one another. And so lying is not cute. But here is one that's deadly to tell you what God really thinks about lying. If you go with me to Revelation 21 verse 8, and I'm going to read this so I don't misquote it. Revelation 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars and all liars and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone, watch this, which is the second death. Now, if you know anything about the sequence of the end times, we know that's all the way at the end of the sequence of everything that happens in the end times. And what it is saying is the lake of fire is that place past hell. This is after judgment. I don't have time to go into that. But liars, lying is good enough. Lying is a reason you can get in there. I wasn't here just to talk about lying because if you think telling a lie is bad with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to now zero in on this text and the revelation God wanted me to give you this morning. Please hear me. With the help of the Holy Ghost, here's what I want you to know. Telling a lie is bad. It may have some eternal consequences. We just talked about it. But living a lie is even worse. And there's some people out there right now, you're missing the bulk of your blessings from God because your whole life you've been living a lie. Worrying about what people think. Worrying about trying to connive to get your own way. Trying to do your thing instead of living the life that God has designed for you. If you are living a lie, it's what's happening here in the book of Judges. You know about this book. If you don't, let me explain to you about the book of Judges. The book of Judges is when God's people after Joshua died, after all the victory, the victorious campaign of Joshua, God's people found themselves in a place that they had made it to the promised land. God said, drive out all the Canaanites. Don't start living like those people. Let them know how special I am. Let them know how powerful your God is. But instead, they went in there and actually matriculated into the sin. What they did is they started serving other gods. So what found out was they were saying, I love you, Lord, but their action said something else. As a matter of fact, you can sit here and tell me you want to turn me off now and tell me, I love God. Who are you talking to? But your actions say, not only do you not love God, maybe you never did. Because the reality is to live a lie. Let me tell you what it means to live a lie. Here it is. When you live a lie, it's when you pretend to be one thing, but you're really something else. 
It's when you say, I'm going to do something, and you do something else. It's when you act one way in front of people, but another way in private. It's when you join something, and you become a part of something, but you're really not committed to that something, and you have no intention of putting in the work, the time, or the integrity to make yourself real in that situation. You just there living out a lie. When you live a lie, you are a phony. You are an imitator. You are both. You are a counterfeit. You are fake. You are not real. That's what this text is about. And when you're not real, then you miss the whole power of God. Because believers not being real is worse than the world not being real. Oh, man. And I could explain this to you. When God created you, he put every blessing, he put it out there for you to receive but the thing is, it can't go to your alter ego or to the messed up you or the you that won't repent or the you that's not fighting to stay on the straight and narrow. All of us fail, but we get back up. All of us have fights, but we make sure we stay on the straight and narrow. So God has placed every plan, every miracle, every promotion, every blessing, but he designed it for you and you're missing it. Oh, I'm going to show you because Samson is going to be our prime candidate that you are missing the blessing of God. The scripture clearly tells us that God does not deal in deception. John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32, John is saying the truth will make you free. Somebody said, won't the truth set you free? No, that's an alternative definition. The scripture actually said the truth will make you free. I believe truth frees up some stuff in God's divine realm that we don't even know about because sometimes telling the truth is not comfortable to us but the scripture clearly says that God wants us to tell the truth watch this God deals in authenticity God deals in truth God deals in integrity God deals in you being real. And when you're not real, you miss the power, guys. You got it now. I see y'all are with me this morning. Come on, let's go get better than that. Here's what I want you to know the Bible says. First, you got to be who God said you are. You can't be complaining about your blessings and you won't even give God a chance by being who he created you to be. What do I mean? Talk, David. Psalms 139, verse 14. King David said, I will praise thee, O God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvelous are the works of thy hand, and thy soul knoweth very well. Did you hear that? Here's what God is saying. Why are you trying to be something else? When I have made you fearfully, that means I took my time, wonderfully. Oh, somebody ought to see it. You are special. God said, I took the works of my hand, created you to be you, and that's when your real power comes, when you you. Quit trying to be someone else. Not only being real means that I build my life on the word. Matthew 7, verse 24. And, in, and it says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a man that built his life on a rock. Building on the rock. What does that mean? The rock is the word of God. So if I build my life on the word, I'm going to get some places where I can get convicted. I'm going to have some times where I got to fight. I'm going to have some times where God's got to show me where my temptations and strongholds are. But look at the results of me building my life on the word. Here's what it says in the next verse. And he said, the storms came. The rain blew. But they couldn't knock me down. Is there anybody here that will testify? I was about to give up. I mean, I felt like it. I was mad at God, my circumstances, and everything around me. But I held on anyhow. Is there a hallelujah out there? Somebody getting ready to say that I stood my ground and I am so glad that I did not leave my Savior. So being real, if you want to tap into the power, means I got to be who I say I am. God made me. He's good enough for me. He must have known what he was doing. Secondly, you got to make sure I build my life on the word. And then thirdly, James 1, 22. James 1, 22. Be ye doers of the word and not just hearers. A lot of us got notebooks full of writing. You flipping through YouTube trying to catch all the preaching you can and still doesn't change your life. You just can't be a hearer. You got to get out there and be a doer of the word. When you don't hear the word, when you don't do the word, it's like being phony. Uh, the scripture actually says it's like a man who looks in a mirror, walks away and forget who he is. Ooh, did you catch that? 
When you don't do the word, just hear the word, no wonder you don't have any power. Because when you walk away, you forget who you are. The exhibit A is Samson. I'm about to blow your mind with this next statement. Many of you, many of us, for years, I've done it theologically. We want to talk about Delilah. What Delilah did and how Delilah made Samson fall. And ooh, Samson, don't listen to Delilah. But can I tell you, Delilah is not the reason Samson fell. Delilah might have been the last straw. Delilah might have been part of his downfall. But remember, Samson had, fought, had done a whole lot of stuff falling way before Delilah. So Samson fell because he was not real. God created him to be one thing. He got his strength. He got his good looks. He got who he thought he was, and he started doing what he wanted to do. Quit blaming Delilah. I know Delilah must have been a bad chick. I understand that. But Delilah is not the reason. What you're trying to say is if he hadn't met Delilah, what I'm saying is there is no guarantee he would have been successful because he was fallen before he met Delilah. That's what I want to talk about today. Be real or be weak. And I want to use the strongest man God ever created. He was supposed to be strong. He was supposed to lead God's people. But he ended up being weak. And in between, it's because he was not real. Let's talk about it. Three things I want to talk to you about. You know, I'd like to give you a roadmap where I'm going. The first one is you were called and set apart for the blessing. I like that. Think about what I just said. When God called you, he set you in a certain spot, and that was for your blessing. The second thing is you were cursed, all of us was, with selfishness. We actually have to fight off selfishness. Come on. There are times when I'm self-centered. Uh, be honest. Have you ever had to apologize? Uh, have you ever had to tell somebody? I was only thinking about myself. And all I'm telling you is when you're self-centered, it yourself, your flesh, your lusts, your desires want to pull you away from God. Are there any real people that say, I got to fight to be humble. I got to fight not to be arrogant. I got to fight because we were cursed with selfishness. Called and set apart, cursed with selfishness. And here's the last one. Cho you got to choose to be special. You have to choose to be special. Come on, I'm alliterating right there. You can't miss that. Called and set apart. Cursed with selfishness. You have to choose to be special. Let's talk about it. The book of Judges. Are y'all with me now? This is anatomy. It's the epitome. It's the biggest example of phony people who said they were real but ended up not being real. What, about, what are you talking about, Pastor? Because Joshua died, as I told you, and we all know that famous speech Joshua gave to them. As for me and my house, if you don't want to serve God, that's good. If, you don't want to, if all God did for you, you don't want to continue to trust him. But how many times bless God bless you? You don't want to love him. As for me and my house, we don't serve the Lord. All Joshua was saying is what some of us say. When I think about it, where he brought me from, what he's done in my life, the times I've had to depend on him. I'd rather have God than anything else. So Joshua said, as for me and my house, they all said, Joshua, we're going to do it. Joshua died. They went into a part of Judges. The book of Judges is one of the most violent, degenerating books in the Bible, telltale about God's people. What am I talking about? In the book of Judges, when Joshua died, judges, they didn't have any kings, so the judges were the political leaders or the tribal leaders, the chieftains, if you will. But they were so phony, falling in love with the land, that they didn't lead their people right. And the Bible says these judges that God placed in didn't become real. That means the people were not real again. The book of Judges uh, is known for this seven or six cycle sin uh, that continues to uh, haunt us even now today. In the book of Judges, here's what God's people did. I know you know this already. God's people would actually be at rest and peace. Oh, those are the good days when God gives us rest and peace. But you know what? We are so arrogant. We are so human. We are so fallen. That's when we get uppity, get beside ourselves. As a matter of fact, we don't rebel when things are going bad. We usually rebel when everything is going good. Pocket full of money, bills paid. That's when we usually mess up. They started rebelling. They were at rest. They started rebelling. Then they were repressed. What were repressed mean? They were turned into bondage. God raised up a nation to put his own people into bondage because somehow, and this is a bad testament on us, if 
we don't have trouble. We don't love God. Don't let that be your testimony. But God has found out, true to the word, that if we don't have some trouble times, we won't get on our knees, we won't pray. So sure enough, they were, they were resting, they rebelled, they got repressed. Then all of a sudden, they cried out to repent. And when they repented, this is, the, this is what makes us stand here now and worship God. His love is so everlasting that God showed up and blessed them and took them out. They got back to rest. Here's the bad thing. The cycle went on and on until the people were so diminished that they looked nothing like what God created. Did you hear that? No, time to stop being phony. You can continue to do the cycle of sin so long till you don't even resemble what God created you to be. Let's talk about it. The book of Judges. Point number one. Called and set apart. The book of Judges starts in chapter, I mean the book about Samson starts in Judges 13. And we find out through verses 1 through 5 what is happening. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord. There's one of those cycles of sin again. And all of a sudden, watch this. There was a barren woman. I like God, how he makes miracles so he can let us know he's God. There was a barren woman. Even though they cried out evil, God showed up when they cried out to God. Before I talk about Manoah, uh, Samson's mother and father, let me say this. Make sure you understand that no matter what kind of sin you do, I'm telling you why I'm still here. I figured out I'm still going to cry out to God. What we normally do is we'll do a sin, and because we justify it or rationalize it, don't see how bad it is, it starts messing with us. And the closer we get to God, the more they say, come on, wasn't there some people out there like me? You could sin one time and it would not mess with you. But now, the closer I got to God, the more that sin takes my sleep. And pretty soon I got to cry out because I find myself in a bad position. And when I get in that position, I repent because the, the urge inside of me, the connection of God, tells me it's time to repent. I repent and usually God shows up and he blesses me. Here's what I'm trying to tell y'all. Instead of waiting on all that repenting and all that mess, you need to understand something. That no matter what you do, no matter how bad your life, I need you to understand something that you are covered. You already blessed. You need to know that God's going to get you out. So instead of sitting around stewing right now and thinking about how bad you are, can I tell you something? God chose you. He knew how bad you were going to be before he chose you. When you got saved, we got saved past. And some of us got some bad past, present, and future. It blew my mind. God said, I'm going to choose you, and I'm going to save you from all your future sins. They were already gone. How come they were gone? Well, I got to go old school on you to tell you why they were gone. Because when I was growing up in church, they used to sing more hymns than they do now. And they used to sing this one hymn, that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it. Why this snow? What am I saying? Jesus paid for it. The reason I'm covered is not because I'm so good, not because God called me to preach, not because I'm still in church. I'm covered because of Jesus. Can somebody celebrate Jesus right now? You are covered. Come on, you should have been gone. You should have been down. There's some situations that should have took you out, but God blessed you anyhow because you're covered. Somebody ought to holler, I am Cover. I'm excited about that because not only that, why am I covered? Because here is the good news and the not so good news. The good news is I am covered. And if you let me get one more hymn out, old school hymn, I'll tell you why you're covered. There's another one that says, uh, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. It will never lose its power. I got, got this part. That gives me strength from day to day. I forgot because I wasn't singing, y'all. That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Here's why you're still free. Here's why, my brother and sister, the devil didn't pull you down. Here's why you can still put a smile on your face although you're sick. Here's why your children are all the way lost. Here's why you got back what you lost and God made the devil give it back to you. Here's why you're still standing strong after the wind knocked you down. Here's why you're still shouting praises to God. Here's why you now don't care about what other people think. When it's time for me to worship, I'm going to worship. Do I have some worshipers out there that will say it's because of the power of God's blood? that I am still standing. No devil in hell, 
Satan himself can't stop the power God has given me. Watch this. So what I'm saying to you is, I said there was good news. The good news is you're covered. Somebody holler, I'm covered. But the not so good news is this. You still have to pay for the circumstance. Because God said we reap what we sow. We're going to find out what Samson did is, uh, let me give you some scripture for that so you understand what I'm saying. That nothing can separate us from the love of God, but salvation is about where your heart is to see whether you can divinely connect to God. Hebrews 10.26 says, For if we sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Can I explain that to you? Here's what it says. Um, if you sin, God's going to make sure you don't go down, you don't go all the way under, but you still have to reap what you sow. There's some consequences. Now, I told you that's the not so good news, but can I tell you why it's a not so good news? Because even when I sin deliberately, somebody catch this, seems like God opens up this can of grace, pours down some mercy, and he keeps my secrets secrets. Come on, there's some things I've done that God should have exposed me for, but he had mercy on me. Somebody, somebody at least need to be glad that there's some stuff in your life that even though you deliberately sinned, by the time you repented, God could have let you bear the whole brunt of that sin, but he did not. He said, I'm going to bless you anyhow. And I'm so glad God kept my secrets secret. There's some stuff I would not want anybody to know. My Savior knows, and he still loves me. But let's get back to Samson. So it says that the people cried out to God, and the answer was Samson. Watch this. Manoah, Samson's father, and his mother, a barren woman. God likes to work through miracles, so you can't take the credit. His, barren, his mother, an angel appeared and said, you shall have a son, and he's going to be a Nazarite. No strong drink. Don't touch any dead things and don't cut his hair. If you go to Numbers chapter 6, you'll find out all of the uh, commands of a Nazarite. So what I need you to understand is that not only are you covered, Samson was called to be a blessing, to get a blessing, and to be a blessing. Come on, make that plain. The people cried out. God could have left them alone, but he called Samson to get a blessing and then to be a blessing. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The reason you be real is because you are the answer to somebody else's problem. Just like God called Samson, he could have taken his people and judged them many more years. I think Samson only had 20 years of up and down judgment. They still got rousted by the Philistines. But think what would have happened if he would have been totally real. He would have been blessed by his gift. God would have been blessed by his gift and the people would have been blessed by his gift. Here is what I want you to know. The reason God took you through what you've been through is because and the reason you should stay real is because you've been called to be a blessing. Everything you go through, God knows that you're going to stand up one day and testify about the goodness of God. What am I talking about? Remember the woman at the well? How the woman at the well, uh, God designed you to be a blessing, to get a blessing and to be a blessing. But you got to stay real true to yourself. So no matter what you say about this woman, even though by the time we meet her in John chapter 4, she's about to give up. What you can say, she's been consistent to who she was. She wasn't in and out and playing around and dipping and dabbing. The Bible said she had five husbands, was shagging up. Uh, she had prostituted herself from man to man. And by this time, she was about to give up, as we might uh, think, because she was going to the well when everybody else was away from the well. But I want you to see the fourth verse of the fourth chapter of John, where it says, Jesus said, I had to go. But I, I got to go by. I love this. I must go by. Samaria. And when I first read that, I wonder why did God have to go by Samaria? Because he was coming for that sinful woman. And you better be glad because it was not only her. God saw you puff, puff, pass, pass. He saw you drinking. He saw you in and out of motels. He saw you fornicating. He saw you lying. He saw you doing all you could do. But then one day, I know there's somebody out there know what I'm talking about. He said, I must go by. I don't know where you were when you got saved. He stopped by and used me. And you know why God chose folk like you and me? Oh, yeah, I know you dancing around your living room right now. He chose folk like you and me because he know that we were bad in the world. We did our thing in the world. And right now, touch me and I'll bleed a praise. Mess with me and I'll shout about Jesus. I'm not the 
Shai kind. I'm going to testify. If it had not been. So God said, that's how you get your blessing. Be real. Let them know I kept you because I called you so you can have a gift. And because you're blessed, you're going to make sure somebody else gets a blessing. So God blessed this woman. She said, come see a man. Do you know? She was called, set apart, so she could reach that city that she reached. Because the text says some folk came and said, now we believe Jesus, be not only because of what you said. Yeah, but that's where it started. Listen to me. Don't you ever give up being you. Don't ever give up because your life is too hard because God called you and set you apart for a blessing and to be a blessing. So what do I do, Pastor? First of all, you got to make sure that you understand I am gifted. So don't bury your gift. What do I mean by that? Stay real by continuing. Even if, folk, even if folk don't like it, don't bury your gift. Matthew 25. Remember? When Jesus went away, or the parable says that the master went away and he left folk with gifts, one with five, one with two, one with one, and the one with one buried the gift. Oh, listen to what the text says. And when God came, when Jesus came back, or the master came back, he said, you wicked and lazy servant. Wow. When you bury your gift, not only are you scorned by God, but when you bury your gift, you miss out on the blessing God is getting ready to give you. He said, well done to the rest. He promoted the rest. But not only that, don't bury your gift. But here's the second thing in that same text that you better make sure you understand your calling and be real. He said, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. How do I know? Because at the end of that chapter, he said to the servant, take the gold that he has and give it to somebody else. Somebody said, I thought the gifts were without repentance. I didn't say God was going to take you give. I said God was going to take the power, the blessing, the promotion, and who you would have really been. He said take it to somebody else, and he cast them into outer darkness. All I'm saying is, don't bury your gift. You might lose, if you don't use your gift, you're going to lose your gift. And the biggest one to me is, when you walk around not being real, you find yourself in a position that you miss out on the bigger blessings God has for you. I believe that God, when he sets this path up, knows the blessings and what I'm supposed to be. I don't know if you ever heard this story before, but there was a farmer who captured an eagle, a baby eaglet, and he strapped him down in the farmyard. And when he released him, because he started watching the rest of the chickens, this eagle would peck, drop his head and peck and bark and, and gobble like a chicken. Uh, he, would gobble, he was running around acting like a chicken. And he thought he was a chicken. Some days he knew he was more, but because he was not real. So this other uh, guy came down from the mountains, a mountain guy, a trapper, and saw this eagle who had now grown up and said, it is a shame that you got such a royal regal bird trapped in this position. And he said, you know what? The farmer said, you know what? That is a shame. So he released the bird. Do you know what happened when he released it? He began to walk around and peck like a chicken because he thought he was a chicken. And then the, the woodsman said, I'm going to fix that. He took this bird, set him up high on a post. And for the first time, this bird viewed the horizon and the wide sky. Next thing you know, he flapped his arms and he took off majestically and royally and he went up higher because he was now who he was, who he was supposed to be. What am I saying? Don't let people put you in and tie you down because when you're not real and you become something that God did not create you, you miss those higher blessings. You should have been further by now. You should have been higher by now. You should have been somewhere by now, but we miss those blessings because we get tied down with the chickens. Whenever you accept God's calling, you go higher. The next point is cursed with selfishness. I want you to know something about this text. That as soon as Samson, you go to chapter 14, so we found out Samson was uh, set apart. His mother and father explained it to him. Chapter 14, as soon as we, Samson, as a grown man, he says in chapter 14, I saw a Philistine woman in Timothy. I want you to go get her for me. And his parents said, don't you know that God has set you to marry an Israelite woman? He said, but I want her because she feels good to me. So what am I saying? 
Samson, soon as he starts, got nothing to do with Delilah. He was cursed with selfishness. He said, it's what I want. Do you know how many people's, have, people's lives have gotten off course because you go around telling God what you want instead of being real and staying where God wanted you? And the Bible tells us that didn't turn out right. The ended up with the woman, uh, the Philistine father said he was going to let the woman marry Samson. You know the story. And then there was uh, Samson had a riddle. And at the bridal party, his wife told the riddle. And when they told the riddle, oh, let me ask the movie. The Bible says his father told the riddle. And when, they, and when he told it, he, said he took Samson's wife, gave her to another man. Samson got so angry. There was a fight. He burned up the crops. He killed him. I'm just telling you, whenever you go on what you want, it ends up bad. Let me stop so you know I know what I'm talking about. How many of y'all know that a lot of the decisions that I made are the ones that I never, ever ever, 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 ever make again. If I knew then what I know now, I would not make that decision. Because whenever you say I want, you supersede what God already said he has for you. Let's keep going. And then we find out later on, he was on his way over to see his bride. He actually killed a lion. The Bible says that the power of God came over him and he killed the lion. But then later on, he went back by the dead carcass, pulled out some honey, Took it to his mother and father to eat. He didn't tell them where he got it from. What am I telling you? Is that Samson actually knew he violated his vow of a Nazarite because he actually ate that honey. And then he actually gave it to someone else. Do you know that when you sin and you get caught up in your flesh and the curse of selfishness, you even cause other people to sin? Somebody said, Pastor, eating honey is a little thing. Why are you all, uh, you know, all messed up about him eating honey? That's how sin starts. The little thing. Let me tell you, uh, again, remember David? It started out first with uh, Bathsheba peep show on the roof. Then David's heart was taken. It led to David calling Bathsheba, a married woman, to his chamber. Then it led to him sleeping with Bathsheba. Then it led to him impregnating Bathsheba. Then it led to him trying to cover it up by bringing her husband Uriah back. Then it led to him murdering Uriah. None of that is as bad as where it really led. Then it led to him not even realizing his state. Oh, I just hit somebody. Some of you listen to me think, well, I'm holy. I belong to this church. I belong to this. I've been saved a long time. Do you know David didn't even realize he had sinned until the prophet Nathan came to him? And that's when he repented. Because when you start allowing the little things, they lead to the big things. And pretty soon you don't even resemble who you were. Do you know that that sin stayed in David's house? It never left David's house. And David had all kind of problems because of the sin that he had. Not only that, let's keep going. David then got addicted. I'm excuse me, Samson got addicted to lust. It says in, he went down and saw another prostitute down in Gaza. He just loved women everywhere he went. He's decided, I'm going to fornicate. Here's what happens. When you're not real, you live a double life. And I'm you can watch um, now you're watching, you know, YouTube and oh, feeling come over you and you hallelujah and you read about, but then you go out and sin and you got so desensitized that you don't even care about it. And in the process, you tear stuff up. He broke down the city. But, you know, you got to kill people to continue to be what God didn't call you to be. And you get in the danger of losing yourself. And finally, because I'm going to close this thing and watch this, y'all. He went even where we are right now with Delilah. Wasn't Samson a good liar? Before we got to our last point, think about what Samson did. He said, now, first of all, I want you to know, act significant. I'm not spooky, but I understand numbers. And numbers say, he said, I want you to, she said, Samson, tell me your strength after they hired her. He said, I want you to, if you tie me up with seven green reeds, seven, that have never been dried. I can't get free. Well, of course he got free. Then he said, if you tie me up with seven new ropes, seven. Then he said, also, if you black my hair in seven braids, seven. All the lies kept building and building, leaving for a place for him to fall. How many lies are you telling? I started out talking about lies. See, he used seven, which is an anointed number. Do you know we got some anointed liars in the church, in the body of Christ? You're anointed because your lies don't even affect you. Samson was such a good liar. 
And the danger is even those lies to Delilah was killing his anointing. Somebody holler be real as I drift to my last point. You don't think that hurts you. All of us are selfish. Selfishness will destroy you. Lot might have been better if he did not. Uh, come and see Sodom and Gomorrah was so much greener and he was selfish and he lusted after Sodom and Gomorrah ended up with his wife turned into a pillar of salt and all kind of problems happening to Lot in that debaucherous city. Not only that, jealousy, the lust in our flesh made Cain kill his brother. It, do you know what? Selfishness will destroy you and take you out of being what God says and many of us are filled with selfishness. As I go to the last point, let me just tell you this. There was, their mother was making pancakes special for these boys for Sunday school. Before they go to Sunday school, she's making this breakfast. And she said, the boys started fighting over who going to have the first pancake. And so the mother said, well, this is a good chance for me to teach these young men how they should act so they won't have to worry about, you know, doing that. And she said, uh, gentlemen, what would Jesus do? If Jesus was here, he would probably turn to his brother and say, you have the first pancake. And both of the boys at the same time on cue said, hey, you be Jesus. Nobody wants to be Jesus. But here's the last point about selfishness. Do you realize Jesus said, unless you, Matthew, take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. So you're committed, I mean, you are called and set apart. We're cursed with selfishness. Samson would have fallen without Delilah. But let's look at where we picked up the text for my last point. You have to choose to be special. This time he told Delilah everything. When the Philistines came, they took him away. Here is the strongest man God ever created. God's warrior. God's best servant. God's deliverer. Am I talking about you or Samson? And look at the condition of your life because you won't be real. You won't sell out to God. Samson found himself bound to a grist mill. So either be real or be weak. He was so weak, his enemies could now take control of him. What I'm saying to you is if you're not real, you become weak enough for everything that's happening to you to happen to you until you stand up. Go through it and trust God. And we found out, look at Samson. He's bowed down. The text tells us the enemies are laughing at him. But then something miraculous happens. His hair begins to grow. When his hair grew back, the text said he called on God and was blessed again. Hair growing back is significant because I'm closing. Here's why. Because Samson now said, let me die with the Philistines. You know, he took them, took him out there blind, they're laughing at him. You know the story, he put his hands on the columns and knocked the columns down. And it said more people died in his death than he had killed in his life. But watch this. What about if Samson didn't get to the point that it was too late and he had to choose death because his life was gone? I'm talking to somebody now. Don't wait till it's too late. Here are six reasons that you ought to make sure you choose to be special. Reason number one, God has miracles already planned that you're going to need in your life. Here's reason number two. God has a plan that is special. He has a plan for you. Listen to me. And even now you can rectify the plan because you're not tied down where Samson is right now. God will do that. Reason number three, the trials you go through, God is going to carry you through them. So none of choosing to be special is going to exempt you from going through, but God will bless you as you go through. Fourth reason, he is always present at the same place you are. Watch that. That makes some sense because you, you got to call him if you're off place. But he'll still show up. But what about if you and him are right there at the same time? That's called an anointed encounter. He's the great physician. He will heal you. I believe 
Now I'm giving you what I've read and what I've essayed from the Bible. And that is when I'm in God's purpose, he does extra stuff. He does special miracles for those who have his purpose, which include healing. And lastly, he hears my every need. Be real or be weak. End up triumphant and victorious or end up bondage and bound. The choice is yours. You got to make up your mind which you will be. Be real. Oh, if Samson would have only lived his potential or end up being weak. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with a no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living just existing well and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did for me.